glad I am to have this conversation with you. You know, there is a sense in which when you are students at uh, one of the best universities in the world, you can be cocky about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it also gladdens one uh, to have an opportunity to have a conversation. As a young student, I read several books which were fiction books, and I want to imagine uh, that many African students had occasion to read those books. If you remember in the 1950s, that was the period when many African scholars were romanticizing about independence and the books that were produced at that time talked about the pre-colonial period and the post-colonial period and the period immediately after the turn of events with military interventions in Africa. And the book that stands out in that category of books is the Evergreen Book by Nigeria's Chinua Ache. Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart stands out because it is written in the context of a society that is changing. And it sends as one story that if you don't adapt, then you fall by the wayside. Immediately after that book, Chinua wrote yet another book, No Longer at Ease. And No Longer at Ease has one of the chief characters, an African who leaves his country and travels to the United Kingdom to acquire education. And his education and other expenses are paid for by a traditional group called the Omofia Progressive Union. And of course, upon return, there are many expectations, but he does not fulfill those expectations. Another book that is written at that time is by Kenya Zumgugi Wathiong the river between. And one of the outstanding statements that I have retained in my memory, having read the river between several years ago, is the instruction to the chief character, Waiyaki. He is told to go and learn the ways of the white man and to bring the knowledge back home so that it may be utilized for the benefit of his country. There is a sense in which you are Latter-day Wayakis, whether you come from Nigeria, or from Liberia, or from Egypt, or from indeed any country, or from Darfur. There is a sense in which there are expectations of the community back home. And to the extent that I have been asked to open the debate about this evergreen subject of Afro-pessimism and Afro-optimism, it is important to understand Africa in the space in which she finds herself. Not so long ago, I had the privilege of speaking about a subject that is not so very different from the one that I am speaking about this evening. And I said that Africa stands out in all the continents as one which is still referred to in these terms. For those who are colonized by the British, it is referred to as Anglophone Africa. Even when in those countries no more than 5% speak the English language. Those who are colonized by the Portuguese, 
will be referred to as Lusophone in Africa. And those who are colonized by the French are referred to as the Francophone Africa. It is, Af is Ali Mazurui in the 1970s and 1980s that hazarded the introduction of yet another description, what he called Arabophone and Swahiliphone Africa. But it did not quite fly because there are not many scholars who embraced and articulated those descriptions in a manner that allowed them to fly into the orbit of accepted scholarship. But that notwithstanding, the subject that we want to wrap our minds around this evening is the subject of Afro-pessimism and Afro-optimism. I've said that when one looks at Africa today, there is a sense in which Africa is still described in very romantic terms. Those who love her want to romanticize about Africa being the on only continent in the world where the Tropic of Cancer traverses, where the Tropic of Capricorn traverses, and where the Equator traverses, and a continent whose uh, a climate is ever or on an even kill, one may romanticize about Africa in that way. But there are those who take the view that Africa has failed to realize the promises that were made or the promises that she made to herself on the eve of regaining her independence in the early, late 1950s and early 1960s culminating in the death of apartheid regime in the 1990s and the birth of South Sudan in the year 2011. And there is merit in saying that Africa has suffered in that way. There is merit in saying that Africa has not punched at her weight or above her weight. There is merit when one wants to be negative about it and when one wants to find as some say, a solution, problem for every solution, to cite conflicts in Africa and therefore to dampen our spirit. In fact, if one were to start from that trajectory, one can remind oneself that only yesterday 180,000 people were expelled from Angola, from the Congo, to go into the Congo, which is xenophobic. One would say that you can see they don't even accept themselves. One can cite the ongoing conflicts in Central African Republic. One can cite the ongoing conflicts in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And of course, one can talk about Somalia. But when one talks about Congo, I've always reminded my audience whenever I have the opportunity, when you see a country using the word democratic as a part of its name, know that it is not democratic. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, that is very frequent in that part of the world. <coughs> So there is a sense in which one can cite that. But one of the things that we don't remember is, is that is the colonial project, as conceived by the colonizers in Berlin in 1884, was a project with a philosophy to it. And the philosophy of the colonial project was to subjugate the African continent for purposes of exploiting our resources. It must also be remembered, although this is something that can't be subjected to debate, and we will debate it at the opportune time, that the colonial project did not end because the colonizers suddenly had a revelation and they became suddenly magnanimous but the circumstances that were created by the World War and the collapse of these countries after the World War were such as to justify the energization of the colonial project. And it's always instructive, particularly for students of law and students of political science, that in 1945, the year of the Charter of the United Nations in San Francisco, and in 1948, the year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
There is a movement, a new entrance have entered into the arena in a very real way. In 1917, after the coming into being of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and therefore the communism is now becoming an alternative tool of analysis. And the coming into being as a world power of the United States of America does redefine the manner in which international relationship is being dealt with. And therefore, the, the process of decolonization starts in that way. But it is always instructive that although African countries were colonized, the agitation to regain our independence, and I'm using this word very deliberately, <coughs> there are those who say that we attained our independence, there are those who say that we acquired our independence, but I'm saying regained our independence as a term of art. And those of you who are students of political science and law will be familiar with the famous speech that was delivered in 1906 at Columbia University by South <laughs> Africa's Pixley Kaisaka Seme, the, the, entitled The Regeneration of Africa. And in that speech, Pixley Kaisaka Seme says a number of critical things. He identified that Africa was the cradle of human civilization. He's being romantic about it, but realistic at once. He is able to cite in his speech what had been done by different civilizations in different parts of Africa. Typically, of course, he'll talk about the pyramids of Egypt. Typically, he'll talk about the astronomy of the Dogon people. Typically, he'll talk about the Monomotapa Empire in Zimbabwe. Typically, he'll talk about the military exploits of Chaka the Zulu. Typically, he'll talk about the women warriors in Gabon and the Cameroon. Typically, he'll talk about the Ashanti Kingdom. And he'll cite all these as a clear manifestation of the existence of a civilization in Africa when the Caucasians were still living in caves. But it is instructive that that speech delivered in 1906 becomes the very speech which provides the raw material that Kwame Nkrumah uses in the speech that he delivers in Addis Ababa on the 24th of day of May, 1963. When on the occasion of the founding of the Organization of African Unity, he exhorts the 32 leaders who are present in Addis Ababa to remember a number of fundamental things. Number one, that the colonial project is a project that was not dead and that it had given birth to another project which he described as the neo-colonial project. Number three, he reminds African states that what happened in Berlin was the creation of artificial states and that what we claim to be our sovereignty is artificial. And that therefore it is incumbent upon the leaders of the day, Nkrumah says, that we begin the project of uniting Africa. And one may say that that is naivete at its most absurd, but it is not. Nkrumah is alive to the fact that Africa is diverse, that there are over 3,000 cultures and languages in Africa, but he is able to recognize that indeed in diversity there is unity, and that in diversity you can emphasize the things that unite you and de-emphasize the things that divide you. And much later on, when the scholars examine the failure of African leaders to embrace what one may describe as the Nukurumaist approach, Ali Mazrui says that although we think that diversity is reminiscent of the Tower of Babel, he creates a term of art and says, indeed, it is the power of Babel. Of course, nobody listens to Nukuruma. Nukuruma says, let us live here with one army, let us live here with one uh, currency, let us live here with one united command, let us live here having identified our capital, and he suggests either we have it in Bangui, in Central African Republic, or Leopold, we'll now call Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Everybody agrees with him on the question of unity, but they are gradualists. They say, let us move slowly, but it warns them 
that when we get used to these sovereignties and the trappings of power, the erstwhile colonial master will come and undermine these. And as if he was a Jewish prophet, no sooner have African countries settled than the process of destabilization starts. And it starts a little earlier. Because in 1960, before the meeting in Addis Ababa, we have a first coup d'etat in Togo when Sylvanus Olympia is overthrown. And a year later in Congo, Patrice Emery Lumumba of the Democratic Republic of Congo is also murdered. And subsequently in 1966, Kwame Nkrumah himself is overthrown. In 1967, we see that Nambia Zikiwe is overthrown. And then we see the beginning of coup d'etats in Africa. And that does undermine the development of Africa, whether it is in health, whether it is in education, whether it is in agriculture, so that Africa begins to suffer from the weight of manufactured conflict. And these conflicts are manufactured in different parts of Africa. France still considers our former colonies as, uh, as enclaves of France. And it is always instructive when you are dealing with France that almost all the leaders who were the leaders in their former colonies also served as deputies in the French parliament. This is true of Félix Souffet when he in Côte d'Ivoire it is true of Leopold Sedat Senghor in Senegal, and it is only a few of them who are not and who did not go to school. And I'm suggesting to us that sometimes the most dangerous people to Africa are sons and daughters who have gone to school. <laughs> because the people who actually reject what I call the Gaullist philosophy are the ones who did not go to school. It is Ahmed Sekotoure of Guinea and Modibo Keita of the Sudan, now called Mali. So one can understand, remember that my subject is Afro-optimism, but that must be contextualized in the sense of appreciating the histories, and I'm not talking about history, I'm talking about the histories of Africa. And one can therefore conclude what one may describe as the French experience. So that France has always remained very present in African affairs up till now, complete with a currency which is controlled from very. In the British colonies, the British are a little bit more subtle. Because number one, they don't go into the arena of assimilation. They are more <coughs> subtle. They give you the impression that they are training you to lead your people. And, and one of the most amazing things, some of you who are from Ghana will remember the Achimota College. I read the paper justifying the creation of the Achimota College. The Achimota College is one of the leading uh, institutions in Ghana in those early days. It was created deliberately to train young men and women to be English, to be Anglophiles. So you can see I'm beginning to suggest that education has also been used as an instrument in capturing our minds. And this is how I understand, for example, I'll come back to it a little later when Kenya's Ngugiwath Young talks about decolonizing the mind. He's suggesting to us that if you are not very careful, education becomes a tool in that regard. Then there are the Portuguese. The Portuguese were a very unique colonizer. As somebody has said, I think it is Samora Moises Marshall of Mozambique, who in one of the most famous speeches that he has given says that one of the things that he finds very curious about his African contemporaries in the struggle is that those of them who are not properly initiated are heard in their unguarded moments saying, do you know we are superior to you were colonized by the Portuguese because we were colonized by the French who are civilized, who produce good wine, who have a good culture and good food. Those who are colonized by the English also tell those who are colonized by the Portuguese we are better than you. And he asks them, are you saying that there is a better slave master than another? <laughs> And he concludes by saying that there is no colonization which is humane. There is no colonization which is designed to help the colonized peoples. 
and that therefore going forward we must always be conscious of the fact that the entire colonial and neo-colonial project is designed to undermine <coughs> Africa and to ensure that Africa remains, as I've said at a different forum, at the dinner table, not as a diner, but as food to be consumed. It is that Africa that we must nevertheless remain optimistic about. Why must we remain optimistic about Africa? You know, Africa is unique in many ways. It is unique in the sense that throughout history, Africa has always attracted other civilizations. Those of you who talk about globalization today believe that globalization is a new word that was invented in the recent past. But I, I take the view that globalization is an old word that has been used differently in different contexts. In the days of slavery, Africans were globalized and commodified. So that if you look at history, you'll find that nearly half the population of Africa was spirited away from the continent and taken to different parts of the world to aid the agrarian revolution in Europe. And therefore, you now find African peoples of African origin in Brazil. And I'm told there are 120 million plus people of African origin in Brazil the largest population of the Negroid peoples outside of Nigeria. And you'll find them in different parts of the world. That Africa has been globalized during the colonial period when African peoples had their esteem undermined, when African peoples were not allowed to participate in the activities of their countries as equals with others. But we now find ourselves in a totally different space. And my view is this. We can, in many ways, try to always claim that we are the way we are because we were colonized. I do not buy that belief. I do not accept that the reason why we are the way we are in many countries is because others have continuously tried to undermine us. Because history demonstrates in the recent past that quite a number of countries which were colonized and which were our aid mates on the eve of independence have succeeded in achieving some of the goals that they had identified for themselves. There are examples that are given almost ad nauseum, but permit me to give them because they are the examples that tell the story. We tell the story of the Koreas. In 1953, we know that they were engaged in a civil war on which there is an armistice even up to today. But today, even the photographs that you are taking, I suspect that you are using Samsung phones <coughs> or some other phones from Korea. What is it that the Koreans did that we have not done? What is it that the Indonesians did that we have not done? What is it that the people of Singapore did that we have not done? What is it that the Indians have done in terms of ensuring that there is appropriate technology that we have not done? What is it that the Vietnamese are doing after the war in 1975 that we have not done? What is it? What is it that the United Arab Emirates have done from the 1990s that we have not done? And when I say we have not done it, I'm not blind to the fact that in quite a number of African countries, there are activities of an economic nature which are progressive. When I talk about Africa not achieving is simply because in terms of the resources that are at, at, at her disposal, she ought to be doing better. But we must ask ourselves what has undermined our well-being. There are Afro-pessimists that I've talked about who take the view that we are incapable of doing these things. But yet there is extant evidence which demonstrates that we have contributed to technological advancements wherever we have been given the opportunity outside of the continent. And in some cases, even within the continent. What are the militating factors that continue to undermine? And I'm suggesting to us that there are a number of things which, in my view, have undermined Africa and therefore stands in the way against our realization of the potential that we have. But 
politics is one of them, and is the culprit on, on, on many occasions. If you look at many African countries, you will discover that the men and women who occupy political office, and I deliberately avoid to use the word leaders when I'm making reference to many African leaders, many African politicians, because leadership is a totally different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. Because leadership is about the ability to utilize political office for purposes of the benefit of the people, and it can be demonstrated in many ways. But when people occupy political office for purposes of satisfying their short-term agenda, then they cannot be leaders, however elastic you use the word leadership. And I'm submitting to us that we, the, the men and women that we have put in political office have stood in the way of realizing our desired gains. Number two, I think that African scholars have also contributed to undermine the African agenda, as it were. We are in the law school at Harvard, which is one of the leading universities in the world, perhaps the leading in many areas. The African students will graduate from Harvard with degrees, who will, upon graduation, when they buy their cars, have a sticker, I was a Harvard alumna, <laughs> who are different for us. If you don't say they were at Harvard, we call you and whisper, say, remind them that I was <laughs> that we have made 
and other generations have made, what are we doing about them? Those of you who are in, uh, in the technological sector, we now know that we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Will the fourth industrial revolution and nanotechnology pass us by? We have seen in our own lifetime the Chinese lift 700 million people out of poverty, and yet millions are submerging into poverty in the continent of Africa. You know, I always say this, when you go into a country and you want generally to know how those countries are governed, look at how people behave at the traffic lights. It is a simple test, but it's a very important test. In many African countries, one of my teachers used to say, when you arrive at what you Americans call the pedestrian crossing, and in Africa we call the zebra crossing, it means that the pedestrians rule. But my teacher used to say that in Africa it means you run like a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> because the motorists will not care. But Despite all the things that I'm saying, I'm submitting to us that we cannot afford the luxury of being pessimistic. Why? One of the greatest things that happens in the lives of a people is the recognition by such a people that we have a problem. In the year 2013, African politicians recognized through the agitation of the intellectual that we have a problem. And that that problem requires, among other things, that we must lift the critical mass of our people into the hard ground of hope. We are the youngest population in the world. 70% of the African population is anything between zero and 35. And that therefore, you must create opportunities for these individuals. First of all, one of the things that we recognize is that the education that we have been giving to our people is designed to create individuals who will go into the employment market. Mm. But we now know that there is no possibility of jobs being created that one will walk into. So we are going into the arena of invention and innovation. And that is the infrastructure, if you may, the economic infrastructure, if you may, that we should be talking about. And those of us who are talking about it have no solution. The solution must come from yourself. So don't ask me, what are you doing? I'm talking about it. That is what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I'm talking about it, I'm telling you that you who are here, you now have an obligation to be creative. Don't say, but what did you do about it? I talked about it, and that is my contribution. If it is in agriculture, what kind of agriculture are you talking about? What are the things that you are doing with your knowledge? A friend of mine went to South Korea and he said he was amazed. He was a PhD holder and he had gone on these typical visits that Africans are fond of doing for the benchmark. So he went there into a polytechnic and was talking to a young South Korean who was in an agricultural institute and he produced a little equipment that he had just, he was working on for purposes of improving agriculture in rural South Korea. And he asked him, you are PhD, what have you produced? What have you produced? Because you have a PhD in agricultural engineering, what have you produced? And I'm saying that you who are the intellectuals in the making, you must now begin to ask whether Africa is capable of feeding herself. And there is evidence that Africa is capable of feeding herself. As a young student in the 1980s, before Mugabe and his acolytes messed up Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe was called the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Whenever you heard that somebody was going to Harare, the first thing you asked them, buy me a shirt because they produce they had a thriving textile industry. As I speak to you now, there is 90% unemployment in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has no currency. Zimbabwe is tottering along because we did not allow people with the knowledge to play a critical role in the process of re-energization and reinvigoration of Zimbabwe. So if there is a Zimbabwe here, don't say I'm only alone. <laughs> You may be alone, but do what you can. 
And if it is not in agriculture, because I've always believed that if you can't feed yourself, then you can't make the next step. Because when people send you chicken from Brazil, this chicken that grow overnight, <laughs> How do you know what is in the chicken? When people send you maize that you've not participated in producing, when people send you things that you have not produced, how do you know? Those of you who have come to the United States of America or gone to other parts of the world, one of the things that they'll not allow you to bring into this country is raw food. In many African countries, you can actually walk eating meat. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying that we must remain optimistic. <laughs> and, and, and you know, they are simple things, but they are critical because they know if you enter with these things in the arena, you are going to destroy the food chain. Mm. Those of you who are in the technological sector, today, and you permit me to just use this example, when we were growing up, in fact, not so long ago, there was a time when the mobile, if you had a mobile phone in your car, you had to make all of us know that you had a mobile phone. Because it cost nearly a thousand dollars. And if the phone did not ring at any one time and you are in somebody's car and they were driving, that individual would pick the phone and, and, and pretend to make a call if only to announce I have one. <laughs> Within our lifetimes, in those days, it was Nokia. In those days, it was Nokia. Today, you can see that the Chinese, out of, out of 10 mobile phones that you have in this room, five are possibly made in China, and all of them are assembled in China. What did they do? Their young men and women in their institutions of learning came to distant parts of the world, even here in the United States. When, you, when I walk in Boston, I see the number of Chinese students, and you can see they are so focused. I do not know whether you see how focused the Chinese are. <laughs> <laughs> even when they are walking, they are focused. <laughs> and their focus, in my view, I do not know, is to finish their studies, to go back to China, and when they go back to China, they are doing whatever they do. I may be wrong about this, but I see them in many parts of Africa. Whatever they do is about Mother China. And I want to believe that the Chinese government can account for almost 100% of the Chinese anywhere in the world. If you ask the Zimbabwean embassy how many Zimbabweans, <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> if you ask the Liberians how many Liberians are in the United States, they have no idea. I'm submitting to us that in whatever area we are, we have a contribution to make. And everybody sees that. About a month ago or two months ago, I was amazed that within one month, the French Prime Minister was in Senegal, the uh, German Chancellor was in, Cain, was in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, the British Prime Minister was in Kenya and in South Africa. The Chinese president was in Rwanda. And I say, what are these fellows doing here? What are they seeing that we can't see? There is something in Africa. And that is why I hold the view that you who are here in the technological sector, you have a duty. And I'm not saying, I'm not one who believes that in order to grow Africa, you must migrate physically to be in Africa. No, I'm not saying that that would be stupid and naive. It is possible to do things in Africa even here. The question is, are you prepared? And if it is in the area of education, what are we doing with our education sector? This country is constantly thinking about ways and means of improving things. You know, if you go to many African countries, and I'm about to conclude in lay this agenda, there are things that stand out and tell me that until and unless we change, we will not realize our potential. And I'll give very practical examples. You walk into a subway, fast food environment, and you find one individual. If that facility were in Africa, there would be 30 individuals 
all getting confused about which cheese to give you. Order is at the very heart of it. Just being orderly. I've seen this young man was my student at the Kenya School of Law, and I'm quite certain that when you came here, you saw order. You saw order. <laughs> and yet the university that he went to was one is one of the most orderly universities in Kenya today. Yet even when he came from that university, he saw order. <laughs> Being orderly is at the very heart of the Africa that we want to create. I was reading or talking to a friend of mine yesterday that the Jap Japanese have just done uh, a survey of how their trains ran last year. And they have discovered that throughout the train system in the whole of Japan, the trains delayed for only three years. Minutes and one, three minutes and one second. <laughs> if, you go, if you go to many African countries, if the train arrives on time, you wonder what is wrong. <laughs> and I want to conclude with this story that was being told by a friend uh, Ben O'Fara was here, I think, when we were being told. Maybe you are not. But the story is told, which is apocryphal, of course, where an airplane, a new airplane has been built in Bernd. And then the lady, excitedly, as the air hostesses normally are, says that you are just about to take off. And she adds this that we are very happy that this is the first aircraft ever to have been made by students at our university. And everybody runs out. <laughs> But only one professor remained, the professor at that university. And he's asked, why did you not run out? He said, why should I run out? The plane will not take off. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral of that story is this. In order for us to realize our potential, we must also regain our self-esteem. The belief that we are capable of doing things. Even the Boeing that you so comfortably, comfortably entered into, there was a first day that they flew. So one of the things that I'm suggesting to us is self-esteem is what will redefine us. And that is why, therefore, I hold the view that those of you from Africa and those of you from outside of the continent of Africa, education is not in vain. Education is about changing the quality of people's lives in the critical areas whether it is in health, whether it is in education, whether it is in agriculture, whether it is in, is, is in the area of technology, whether it is in the area of economics, we must now begin to have young Africans and young people in the world who are going to go out there and rebuild Africa. And I hold the view that Africa Agenda 2063, with which you must acquaint yourself, provides a good architectural plan. Today, one of, uh, one of my mentees from Mexico City sent me a message. He said, we must not wait until 2063 to realize these goals. I told him, goals are not there that you must score. Goals are there that we must shoot close to them. The closer we are, the more celebratory we are. So Agenda 2063 is a roadmap that allows you to look at how Africa will be 20, rather in 40 years from today. In 40 years from, in 2063, you'll, most of you will still be alive. You'll be mature, but the beauty is, as I conclude, is that you are at one of the best universities in the world. But that is not an end in itself. That is the beginning of the beginning. What are you going to use with your law degree? What are you going to do with your economics degree? What are you going to what are you going to do with your computer science degree when you get back home? This is what will be asked of you. And I'm submitting to us that the continent of Africa, when I look at her, in 50 years' time, she'll be a beautiful continent. Amen. But only if we work at it. If we don't work at it, it will not be. So go out there and begin, number one, by decolonizing your minds. 
Begin by identifying what you want to do. Identify your niche. Begin your area of, identify your area of contribution. Enter into collaborative efforts that inform the things that you will do because Africa is going to be built village by village, block by block. I conclude with these two statements, one from Adi Mazrui. During the struggle for apartheid, he was asked, you talk so much and, and, and against apartheid, what is the contribution that you will make in the struggle? He said, the only contribution is that I have taken the decision never to buy apples from South Africa. And I'm asking all of you, he said, to identify the single thing that you will do, and all those combined will bring appetite down. The other statement is from Mother Teresa of Calcutta. He said that when you get into a dark room, the natural inclination is to complain about the darkness. But he said, if only you could light your own candle and your neighbors light their own candles, darkness will be conquered. So don't ask what your neighbor is doing. Ask what you can do. And if you ask that question, I believe Africa can be great. Perhaps not in your lifetime, but during the lifetime of your children's children. That is my contribution in offering this debate. We may now cross-fertilize our minds. <laughs>